Hello, my name is Andrew Holmes. I am here to uh, review with you the ethical and professional standards material for your upcoming CFA exam. Now, uh, you probably got into uh, the CFA program or decided to pursue a CFA charter because you like things like economics and you know financial statement analysis. Well, you may not like that, but anyway, uh, you're interested in those things that uh, lead to being a better analyst. You probably didn't start off with the idea that, oh, I really want to study ethics and uh, professional standards of conduct and those types of things. But as part of this uh, program, you're going to need to spend some time on this. So my experience is that people have a hard time picking up significant points uh, in ethics, and it is an, an area where you can improve. That is to say, your intuition will serve you really well, hopefully, in economics and in equity and derivatives and those types of things. That's likely material that you think about uh, on a regular basis. This material uh, is going to be something where you're going to have to dig in and learn the specifics. That is, you're simply being a good person, being, uh, as you perceive it, ethical, is not going to get you very far as you, uh, pr as you work through this material or as you address ethics questions on the exam. So as you go through this, be prepared to make notes, underline, you know, like I said, you've got to dig in and make sure that you are getting this material in the specific because understanding it in the general is not going to help much <clears throat> on the exam. So what we want to do is we want to start out by talking about what happens if there's a bad outcome. That's a violation. We're only going to spend a few minutes on that and then talk about what it is that would be violated. So the, big, the two big things that we have to do here, there's some other stuff at the end, but the two big things that we have to do are one, talk about this code of ethics, and we'll see that that is uh, uh, something we can take care of fairly quickly. It's a fairly poetic statement of what would constitute ethical behavior, but then we're gonna have to dig in and talk about standards, and it's the standards of professional conduct that, uh, as I would say, where the rubber meets the road, and likely the area that you're going to have to spend the most time on as you prepare for the exam. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. So if we're going to talk about a professional conduct review, okay, that is, there is some reason to suspect that somebody who is subject to uh, CFAI's uh, uh, jurisdiction, that is a candidate or a member of CFAI, has uh, committed some sort of wrongdoing, well, then there is a disciplinary review committee okay, that is uh, you know, something that is uh, constituted by the Board of Governors, and they have the responsibility to conduct this, uh, uh, this review uh, to determine whether or not there should be sanctions against a member or a candidate. So the CFAI Institute, through the professional conduct staff, is going to uh, conduct an inquiry if there is some reason to suspect that there has been misconduct on the part of uh, someone who has agreed to abide by this particular code and standards. So uh, how does that occur? Well, there's several ways that we can actually uh, get one of these reviews started. The first would be self-disclosure. So that is, uh, you uh, have done something wrong. In the middle of the night, you have a crisis of conscience. You type out an email and you send that off to CFAI and say, this is what I did and here's all the documentation. Well, self-disclosure. You are a member or a candidate, and you have told them, this is what I did wrong. They will, uh, in response to that, conduct an inquiry to see if they should sanction you or you kick you out of the program or whatever it happens to be. Uh, also, written complaints. So if uh, somebody, uh, uh, perhaps a client, uh, decides that what you did was unethical or believes that some action you, you took was unethical, they will write a letter, send it off to CFAI, that will eventually find its way to the review staff, and they will then decide whether or not this merits a, an official review, and of course that will start the process. Okay, there can also be evidence of misconduct, uh, such as something that shows up in the newspaper. So uh, somebody, was, uh, you know, somebody was stealing uh, candy from babies or money from little old ladies, and uh, somehow that ends up in the newspaper or some, uh, some other me media source, and as a result, it comes to the attention of CFAI, and they say, oh, well, we better investigate to protect the um, uh, reputation of the designation and the organization. Now, one thing that you don't want to get involved with is this uh, report by a CFA exam proctor. 
So um, the uh, proctors are given very specific instructions, and if you violate uh, any of those instructions, they're going to have a little sheet of paper, and they're going to write it up and send that in, and, uh, and CFAI doesn't release any statistics. But I would suspect that this actual, uh, the CFA exam proctor reports, probably are a primary source of, uh, of these professional conduct reviews. So uh, just as a quick word to the wise, uh, make sure that uh, whatever the rules of, that are in place on exam day are, whatever those happen to be, make sure you're in compliance and don't mess with the proctors. Okay? Also, there could be indirect evidence in terms of the analysis of exam scores and materials, monitoring of websites, social media, those types of things. So there's a number of ways that we could actually have a review uh, initiated, anything from you reporting it to some sort of a social media stuff that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, the Institute was monitoring. All right. So uh, in this case, uh, there's, once we have some reason to uh, suspect that there could, or to, some reason to believe there could have been a violation, so just because there's a review doesn't mean there was a violation. It just means there's going to be an, inqu an inquiry. But once we decide there's going to be an inquiry, there are several outcomes that can occur. Uh, the good one, if you're involved, is that there'll be no disciplinary sanctions. So they said, well, somebody wrote us a letter, said that this person was lying, cheating, and stealing. And uh, as a result, the uh, institute uh, uh, convenes a board and, uh, and, and convenes the committee and has a review. Well, at the end of it, they say, yeah, I don't think this was a violation. This was just somebody that got mad because they lost money or something like that. So that would be the good outcome if you were the subject of the review. The second would be just a cautionary letter. Uh, that is to say, look, this was uh, skirting the edge of what was, uh, what was acceptable behavior, and uh, so there's no real uh, ongoing uh, uh, penalty for that, but it is uh, sort of the idea that you've been sanctioned uh, by, your, by your peers. And then they can also, of course, decide to discipline uh, a member, and that could be you know, the condemnation by uh, your peers. Uh, you could have your participation in the program suspended. Uh, you, if you're a charter holder, you could uh, lose the right to, to, use your, uh, to use the charter or to use the CFA designation uh, that you had previously earned. So anyway, so a number of outcomes here, and of course, uh, the more severe and more obvious the violation, then the worse uh, it's going to be, from nothing all the way up till the, to being kicked out of the program. All right, so that's what happens, and those are what I meant by bad outcomes. So if there is a, we, we are, take upon ourselves an obligation to uh, abide by the code and standards, and uh, hopefully we will all uh, live up to that uh, commitment, and we won't ever have to worry about those, uh, those bad outcomes associated with uh, professional disciplinary committees. Okay? But now let's move on and talk about what it is that we are agreeing to abide by. So there's, again, like I said earlier, there's two parts here. There's the code of ethics. That's uh, basically six statements that I think you will agree uh, are um, uh, fairly poetic. And then uh, we will move on into the standards that uh, are sort of, uh, well, I guess the, you can view the code as being the big picture and the standards get into the uh, nitty gritty. So uh, the code of ethics, six parts. The first one is act with integrity, competence, diligence, respect, and in an ethical manner. Okay, and that, uh, it, that applies regardless of who you're dealing with. That could be the investing public, clients, prospective clients, uh, your employer, uh, employees, colleagues, all, that sort of th all those sorts of uh, situations. And what this basically says is act in an ethical manner. So point one of the code of ethics, act in an ethical manner. Well, that's pretty all-encompassing. Uh, and it's the, reason, the reason I call this poetic is because when we say you should act in an ethical manner, well, I think everyone would agree with that. The problem comes in defining what is an ethical manner. So we're going to start out with the very broadest of uh, claims, that is uh, acting in an eth ethical manner, and then we're slowly, as we get through the, uh, uh, through the rest of the code and then into the standards, we're going to see that we get a much finer definition of these points. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the integrity of the investment profession and the client's interests uh, always come before personal interests. That is to say, integrity is going to be paramount and the client's interest always comes first. So act with integrity, put the client's interests first, uh, and if you're uh, acting in, in, an, in an ethical manner and you are putting your clients first, uh, you're acting with integrity, well, that's going to be a good way to live your life. I think uh, you're going to find very few people 
that will disagree with that claim. The third part, uh, reasonable care and independent professional judgment. Uh, that is to say, when you are making, when you are acting in your role okay, as an investment advisor, advisor or an analyst or portfolio manager, you have an ethical responsibility to exercise reasonable care and independent professional judgment. So uh, and when we talk about, uh, we'll see this uh, sort of recurring theme of you know, conducting analysis, making recommendations, taking investment actions, all that sort of stuff. The best way to summarize that is just all your professional activities. So when you are engaged in professional activities, you are expected, as in, uh, expected to the extent that it is a requirement of ethics, okay? not just uh, law and not uh, you know, economics, but it's an ethical responsibility to have reasonable care, meaning that you are, uh, well, we'll define that later, but you can think of that as you would exercise care as if it was your own money that was being invested, uh, and uh, independent professional judgment. So you're going to be independent, that is, you're not going to have your judgment tainted by some sort of outside uh, conflict. So uh, use reasonable care, be independent, uh, that's going to be the third part. So the uh, fourth, and I find this to be one of the graceful parts of the Code of Ethics, it says to practice and encourage others okay, to practice in a professional and ethical manner. So uh, I think that uh, the notion, uh, you can read uh, uh, different, uh, I guess, ethical statements uh, from different professional bodies, and they all talk about you should act in an ethical manner. When I say that this is a graceful part of the code of ethics, I think the notion of encouraging others, those around us, to act in an ethical manner is a higher standard and, all, and I think a more noble standard as well. So we are going to uh, encourage others to act in a professional and ethical manner, and we want to be a credit to the profession. And that's not just a... That's not to say be a credit to the profession as type of a rah-rah, you know, let's all be wonderful people. That's a good thing, being a wonderful person. Okay, but uh, the point here is, is that uh, we're going to see as we go through this material that the confidence of the investing public in the markets and in the profession is paramount to all of our interests. So if we can practice and do so in an ethical manner, encouraging the others, uh, other people around us, the other professionals around us to do the same, well, we'll be a credit to the profession and we're all going to be better off, both as investment professionals and as the investing public, because of it. All right? uh, the um, uh, fifth part, uh, promote integrity of the capital markets okay, for the ultimate benefit of society. So the integrity of the capital markets, again, uh, what we don't want to have happen is we don't want the investing public to lose faith in the capital markets. So the capital markets are a really essential part of the wealth creation process in our society. And uh, in order to have well-functioning capital markets, we need lots of investors. We need lots of independent decision-making. And if, uh, if, in general, people lose confidence in the capital markets, well, that's going to have really bad outcomes. So what we want to do is up uphold capital market rules, and of course, I guess the regulations, I should make sure and underline that as well. And then finally, we want to maintain and improve our professional competence okay, and strive to do the same for other investment professionals. So again, just like we want to encourage others to practice ethically, okay, we want to maintain and improve okay, our professional competence, but we also have an opportunity to bring everybody else along with us. So we're going to be competent and we're going to help our colleagues and um, uh, friends in the industry to be competent as well. Again, I think looking beyond, uh, beyond one's own practice, uh, you know, the actual activities that you engage in, professional activities that you engage in, is uh, again a graceful part of this statement. So, six parts to the Code of Ethics. And uh, I think these are very high-minded, and uh, I think, uh, in a sense, they, uh, well, I think there's very, little, uh, there's very little disagreement that what the Code of Ethics says would be good for society and would be good for the profession. Uh, so I don't see a whole lot here that uh, would be controversial. The trouble with this is, is that it's at such a high level it doesn't make for great questions on the exam, right? So uh, if the question is, well, should you be competent or not be competent? Okay, well, yeah, not very many people are going to say, oh, you shouldn't be competent, right? 
So the code of ethics, again, I uh, use the word poetic. Uh, I think we would all agree that uh, the world would be a good place if everyone lived up to these standards. Okay? But you can think of this as sort of setting the, uh, the penundra, the, el the, uh, the uh, umbrella over the uh, material that we're going to review next, which is going to be the standards of professional conduct. So what we're going to see is that this uh, code of ethics, these six statements, are going to flow in to the seven different standards of professional conduct, and it's here in the standards of professional conduct that you're going to spend most of your time as you study ethics, uh, and uh, also it's going to be uh, where there's probably the highest potential for frustration because there's lots of minutia that you're going to have to get on top of as you work through this. So before we actually dig in and say, okay, let's talk about standard one professionalism, knowledge of the law, right? That would be, you know, part one, subpart A. Well, let's take a look at what the uh, standards of professional conduct are going to look like overall, right? So we'll a quick trip through each of the seven different standards, and then we'll go back and we'll dig into each of them individually. So the first standard is professionalism. Uh, obviously, this says, look, we are, uh, we are professionals in an uh, uh, industry that has uh, societal importance, so we need to do several things, right? One, we have to have a knowledge of the law, so you want to make sure that you understand what the applicable laws and rules and regulations are. Uh, you're not going to be able to comply with the law or comply with regulations if you don't know them to begin with. One thing that I think you're going to see is really important, and I'm going to talk about it extensively as we go through, and once we dig into the material a little bit deeper, is this idea of independence and objectivity. So maintaining your professional independence and objectivity is going to be a, a key part of being able to honor your fiduciary responsibility, which is to say, look, if I have a debt of loyalty to a particular client, okay, I have to be able to make independent and objective decisions and when that is tainted, okay, when that doesn't apply, uh, your decision making is uh, almost, certainly, almost certain to be flawed. So this idea of independence and objectivity is going to be a big deal and it's going to be a recurring theme that you see as we go through these uh, seven parts. Okay, the idea of misrepresentation, okay, so uh, this basically says be honest, and then uh, the misconduct uh, requirements here. Uh, this is what I call the mommy rule, and I'll talk about why it's the mommy rule when, when we dig in a little deeper. But what it says is, don't do anything you shouldn't do. And so uh, it's kind of the catch-22. Standard two, the integrity of the capital markets. What are we going to do with material, non-public information? Notice that there's two words there, material and non-public, so we need to make sure we carefully define both of those. And then we also are going to talk for a few minutes about uh, market manipulation, if you're manipulating the markets, well, then you are going to be destroying the uh, public uh, faith in, these, uh, in the capital markets, and that's, of course, going to have sweeping societal impact, negative societal impact. So uh, any, any attempt to manipulate markets or manipulate prices or to, uh, you know, uh, to create false impressions of volume are going to be something that would be very strictly a violation of the standards of professional conduct. Third is the duty to clients. Now, uh, all seven of the standards are going to be important, and you're going to have to spend some time studying all seven of them, uh, but I don't think they're all created equal. Uh, in particular, if you want to think about when is it that uh, it will cause the most anxiety, uh, or, you know, I guess the most anxiety at CFAI, or the uh, biggest uh, splash in the press, is it when we have something with our professionalism and we didn't know exactly what the law said, or is it when somebody does something to, uh, you know, screw up a client, right? Uh, I'm not sure that's a very professional language, but anyway. So duty to clients, I think, is actually the, the sort of the centerpiece of the seven standards. So this standard number three, uh, all of them are going to get tested. You're going to study all of them. Okay, but I think you're going to find that uh, focusing a little bit more on duty to clients is something that would make for time well spent, all right? Because the violations of this particular standard are the ones that end up in the newspaper and end up in, uh, you know, the courtroom and uh, end up with, uh, you know, some sort of a professional review at CFAI. So uh, be careful about these and you can, uh, you can I think, it, to the extent that you understand these five, these five subparts, you can leverage that to understand some of the other material that surrounds it uh, fairly well. So first, loyalty, prudence, and care. I'm actually going to take this loyalty, prudence, and care idea, and I'm going to companion it with independence and objectivity, 
because then when I go through the uh, standards of professional conduct, I'm going to talk about my three pillars. And uh, so that's gonna basically going to constitute the first pillar, and I'll talk about that as we go through again. But nonetheless, this notion of determining where your loyalty lies or adhering to your debt of loyalty to a client, okay, well, that's going to be paramount. If you are doing anything that is disloyal, okay, you are not honoring your fiduciary responsibility, well, that's, uh, in some sense, that is the worst of the ethical violations. So you're going to find that to be very important. Fair dealing, meaning that we're going to deal with all clients fairly. Remember that fair and equal are not the same thing, okay, but we're going to have to strive for um, uh, this notion of being fair in our dealing with all clients, okay, not just big clients or not just uh, clients that uh, compensate us in a particular manner, but all clients, we want to be fair with how we deal with them. Suitability, I think you're going to see that this shows up over and over again. I better put an asterisk by A there as well. Uh, so suitability, this, the term, this basically says we need to make sure that any professional activity, that is recommendations, actions, all those types of things, okay, we have considered whether or not the attributes of this particular recommendation, let's think of uh, you know, adding a security to a portfolio, Okay, is this suitable for this particular investor? That is, given this investor's goals, okay, that is their objectives, given their constraints, is this suitable for the, this particular investor? And that's going to be something, that, again, that we're going to see come up a lot. Okay, performance presentation, okay, this is going to re refer to how we communicate with clients, and we're going to see that there's some subtlety here. And there's also a whole other topic that we can go through, and that's going to be uh, the GIPS stuff, that is uh, Global Investment Performance Standards, that relate to this as well. So this is something that has lots of meat behind it. And then, of course, preservation of confidentiality. We have a lot, access to lots of confidential information in our industry, and uh, we should not be loose-lipped is what this is basically going to say. There's some uh, very... Uh, uh, I guess there's some great guidance in how we preserve confidentiality as we go through. Okay, but what it's basically going to say in the end is, look, if you have privileged information, then you keep it to yourself, right? So uh, who do you, under what circumstances can you share that? Well, there are a few. Primarily is going to be with uh, other professionals who are working on the same problem and a couple of other situations as well. But nonetheless, confidentiality is going to be a big part of our duty to our clients. The fourth standard is duty to employers. So uh, here we're going to have a debt of loyalty to our employer, just like we have a fiduciary responsibility to a client. We also have a debt of loyalty to our employer, and we're going to talk about uh, what that means, and the implications of that can actually be quite sweeping, and I'm going to give you a, uh, a mental exercise or tool for how to think about duty to employers uh, when we get to this in more depth. Uh, additional compensation arrangements, so if you are you know, you're moonlighting, you're working uh, outside of the firm, uh, doing something that could potentially conflict with the firm. Okay, what are the circumstances under which you can do that? What are the disclosure requirements, that type of thing? And then the responsibility of supervisors as well. And I think that this is sort of the poster child for what, uh, uh, when we think of uh, where do we have to be really, really careful, especially in exam terms. Uh, so this responsibility for supervisor, of supervisors is going to require... Uh, a, very, uh, a very exacting, a very high standard for what would constitute safe harbor. So when have supervisors done what they need to do? Well, they're going to have to be very active and very conscientious in order to comply with this uh, standard four. Standard five, investment analysis and recommendations. So here we're going to talk about diligence on a reasonable basis. Uh, you're going to see this come up again and again. I think it's one of the really important parts of the, uh, of the code and standards. Uh, but when we are making decisions, we have to be diligent and we have to have a reasonable basis for what we're doing. We also need to be careful about communication with clients and prospective clients. So uh, how, are we, how are we communicating our investment analysis, our recommendations, those types of things? And then, uh, as I think of it as more of a side note, actually, is this idea of records retention down here at the bottom. Well, there are some guidelines for record retention. What this is basically going to say is, well, you ought to make sure that you uh, retain uh, your uh, sources, that is, when you're, uh, when you're performing analysis, you want to make sure that you can replicate that in the future if you were ever called upon to do it. Uh, but it does make something, uh, it does make a lot of sense, and it actually does rise to the, uh, uh, to the notion of being an ethical requirement, right? You need to be able to uh, defend what you have said, and you need to be able to show that you did, you were diligent, and that you did have 
a reasonable basis for the actions that you took. Right? And st uh, almost to the end of this, uh, quick review anyway, we're at now at, uh, at standard six, conflict of interest. Uh, and conflict of interest, uh, this, is the what, uh, this is a really important part in the sense that if in the first five that we've gone through there's any problem, well, a remedy to, to many problems that we could run into would be a disclosure, right? So if we're talking about conflicts of interest, what we, what we would prefer to do is to eliminate uh, conflicts of interest or certainly minimize conflicts of interest, but of necessity in our industry there are going to be conflicts and what we're going to need to do is make sure that those conflicts are adequately disclosed and there's some, uh, some particular areas of concern around disclosure that we're going to talk about. Also, priority of transactions. So uh, when do we trade for our account versus employers versus uh, our clients? And then also referral fees in the sense of if we're referring a, if we're referring a client to some other professional, well, do we get a, a referral fee for that? Or if we're paying referral fees to have clients referred to us, well, we're going to be very particular about what the disclosure requirements are because that does, of course, create a conflict, right? And then finally, we can think of the first uh, six standards as being something that is fundamental. It wouldn't be unreasonable to say that the first six standards would apply to any person acting that wanted to act in an ethical manner that was a, an investment professional, right? Now, not everybody has specifically uh, obligated themselves to those six standards, but uh, as, uh, as people who have or as members of the Institute, we could argue that, well, if you are not living up to those first six standards, then you uh, probably ought to examine what you're doing. But this one, the seventh, applies just to you and I. Okay? Me, as a CFA charter holder and an institute member, and you, as a CFA candidate, there are some specific things that you have taken on yourself uh, that are summarized here. That is, uh, the conduct, conduct as participants in the CFA Institute programs and the way we reference uh, the CFA Institute uh, and our participation, our participation either in the CFA charter holder uh, exams, or CFA exams, uh, that is going through the examination process, or after we are done with it and our charter holders, how we uh, refer to the designation, those types of things, all of that is going to be summarized here in Part 7b. So those are the, that's a quick look at the standards of professional conduct. Of course, the real issue here is not to take a quick look, but it's to actually dig in and uh, make sure that you have a firm understanding of each of these, each, you know, each standard and each of these subparts. An important point might be to note that you don't have to have the numbering system down. You don't have to know that uh, conduct as participants in the CFA Institute programs is 7A. But you do have to know that it is under responsibility, or your responsibilities as a CFA Institute member or candidate, and you do have to know that it, is re re it corresponds with Part A, that is, the conduct of participants. So the numbering system isn't important. But being able to identify which standard and potentially which subpart is uh, potentially being violated in a question, uh, something that you come across on the exam, that is going to be important and you're going to have to know it well enough to be able to identify standard and subpart in order to be able to address a lot of the questions that you'll see on the exam.